and we start with uh, one of those challenges uh, that you have seen in the introduction in the in the video leading change and we have invited Sandy Barua, Sandy is CEO and President of the Detroit Regional Chamber and also a member of our TCI Advisory Board to give us some inspiration based on his experience in Detroit on what means good leadership in the new normal and how to build a good roadmap to transform organizations. Welcome, Sandy. Good morning, Patricia. How are you today? Fine. Looking forward to your Great. presentation. Well, thank you. I, I believe I have a PowerPoint that hopefully will uh, come up on screen. Is that correct, Patricia? Excellent. It is correct. Well, hello. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is uh, very much my pleasure to be joining you from uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, USA. It is also my pleasure to be a member of the advisory board of TCI and uh, share uh, in the knowledge that uh, from from my peers from around around the world and I'm so very grateful for TCI for uh, this this two-day convening uh, for this very important uh, conversation. Uh, let me go ahead and get started. Uh, we're clearly in a, an unprecedented period of time. Uh, you know, that is probably the understatement of 2020. Regardless if your nation has handled the COVID experience well or not, uh, certainly the initial thought that this was going to be a short-term crisis uh, with maybe just uh, a few weeks or even a few months, uh, we have uh, certainly seen that to be not the case. This is obviously going to be something that we're going to be in true crisis for uh, a year or more. So uh, if we could go to the uh, first slide, please. Um, I think that the most important thing to remember as we think about what our role is as leaders in uh, this crisis environment and what our role as leaders leading economic development and cluster organizations is to keep in mind that we are in the middle of the crisis. Uh, the crisis is far from over, and the reason I want to stress that is because my rule for crises is, is that, you know, when we're in the middle of a crisis, we never change as much as we think we will, but we never change as much as we probably should. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, as we sit in the middle of this crisis and we are living in this unprecedented time, uh, it is very hard to know what exactly uh, the world is going to look like as we emerge from this crisis. And I will give you two very quick uh, examples, and I apologize if they're just a little uh, North American U.S. centric. Uh, after uh, the terrorist attacks uh, in 9-11 uh, in the United States, there was a lot of discussion in uh, the weeks after, even the months after 9-11, about the impacts on air travel. Uh, the uh, that air, air travel people would not feel safe going on airplanes again because airplanes were being used as terrorist weapons. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, real estate, commercial real estate, especially in high-rise buildings, uh, that people were going to be afraid to go up into uh, high-rise buildings. There was a lot of a doom and gloom about the future of uh, big urban financial centers such as London and New York and others, uh, that those businesses uh, were uh, going to uh, decentralize their operations and move out to more suburban Urban communities uh, and that actually was happening to some degree and people were pointing to those signs. Obviously none of those trends lasted uh, very long. Air travel came back strong, New York City came back exceptionally strong uh, and we continued to build and live and work in high-rise buildings. Similar after the great uh, during the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, there was a lot of discussion that that recession was so deep and uh, so powerful that uh, we as human beings would learn the same lessons that our grandparents learned during the Great uh, Depression of the 1930s, uh, and that would really uh, 
it really impact our psyche, if you will. Uh, clearly it did not. Uh, coming out of the Great Recession, we saw the de democratization of luxury. Uh, we saw uh, incredible growth, uh, uh, the kind of the, the wage gap uh, increasing. So it's very hard to tell what's going to happen afterwards. So that is my disclaimer that we need to be a little cir circumspect about how uh, this uh, crisis is going to unfold. But there are some shock thoughts I would like to share with you all in terms of how we are thinking about uh, going through this crisis and uh, what we're going to have to do as we come out of this crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So as we uh, know, the one thing that is almost certain to change is our experience with every other economic slowdown always results in a post economic slowdown, boost in technology and automation. We expect this trend to be even more pronounced coming out of this particular uh, uh, economic slowdown. And why is that? Of course, uh, this economic slowdown is caused because of people interacting with each other, people touching things. This is going to lead to a, uh, a huge acceleration in automation. And that is going to put more and more of our semi-skilled and certainly our unskilled citizens uh, in a more difficult position in terms of finding meaningful job employment afterwards. This is a very, very important and worrying trend, especially for our organization uh, as our educational attainment levels here in the uh, Detroit, USA uh, region uh, lag. Uh, many parts of the United States and certainly the United States uh, lag some of our best in class peer competitors across the planet. And, it, and we all know that the team or the country or the region with the best skills are the ones that are going to succeed. So coming out of this challenge, we're going to have a shared challenge of ensuring that we as economic development officials, as public policy officials, we are working uh, very, very hard, redoubling our efforts uh, and making a central role of our organizations to develop and implement strategies that address the less skilled among us and ensuring that they have pathways to increase skills uh, because the pathway of finding jobs for these people is going to become increasingly difficult. Next slide, please. When we talk about skilled talent, uh, we have a different challenge. One of the things that this crisis has shown us is the ability for more of us, especially those who are technologically savvy, are in the higher skill level, higher income level, have a much greater ability to work remotely than we ever thought possible. This is going to lead to some uh, very interesting changes in terms of how skilled talent is deployed across our organizations and across our regions. This is going to be uh, some interesting um, uh, challenges for, say, business attraction, uh, for example. Uh, if businesses are able to uh, employ talent uh, from, from, uh, from a greater distance because they are not as needed to come into a core central office quite as often as they did before, that is going to change the dynamics of how our companies in our clusters or in our regions access talent. I am unsure as to how this dynamic is going to unfold, but it's definitely going to be a change and it's something that we need to understand because our skilled talent, we believe, is going to have even greater flexibility in terms of where they live and where their job opportunities are. So they may be, you know, uh, they, their job may be based in the UK, but they may choose to live uh, in Sweden. Uh, obviously that is happening now, but we anticipate that this trend will accelerate and this will give uh, our, our member companies a much more flexibility, but it also creates some challenges on, on, on the talent development and the talent attraction front. Next slide, please. So, while it's not directly related to the COVID crisis, 
uh, we are seeing a global movement that is really uh, co-led by the corporate community to focus on racial justice. And even though this is not a direct COVID challenge, it is uh, a real sustainable effort. Now, many nations uh, that are represented uh, on this conference uh, have been doing great work, uh, both from the private sector and the public sector around racial justice and diversity and inclusion. Uh, for those countries, that is a competitive advantage for them. For other countries, in fact, the United States is probably in the middle uh, of, of, of the span of countries that are doing it well and uh, have not uh, really engaged in this. Uh, this is going to be a change in how our corporations uh, and our employees look at the employment landscape. And companies are going to have to uh, not only respond to the societal challenge that is very real, and, and must be addressed and is frankly overdue, they're going to have to employ strategies that make it very clear to their employees that these companies are truly engaged in the fight for social justice and that they are playing a positive role and that their employees will have an opportunity in the workplace as part of their official work to engage in social justice and, uh, and diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, this is going to be a talent attraction uh, effort uh, and it's going to be a talent retention effort. And this is also important for regions because it's one thing for companies to be doing this internally, but they're certainly going to have to have region-wide uh, public policy-led efforts to make sure that their regions are welcoming uh, to this kind of discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So business attraction, um, uh, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but it is, it is unclear to us in terms of how the increased remote work uh, is going to change the business attraction play. Will uh, business attraction rely perhaps more heavily on cost of location because they're going to be able to access their talent more remotely than they did before, uh, thus making, you know, say, tax benefits and incentives or cost of doing business uh, slightly more important than it was uh, in the past. Uh, obviously, we know that the primary uh, goal of companies when they're looking for uh, uh, looking for relocation opportunities was access to talent with costs perhaps playing a secondary role. There's a chance going forward that that might equalize as time goes on. Next slide, please. Office real estate, this is an area that we think is less likely to change going forward. Uh, I, I equate this to the discussions that we had uh, kind of during the days after the 9-11 terror attacks where people thought that we were going to be leaving large buildings and we were going to be leaving our urban centers. Uh, I think this is a temporary phenomenon. Uh, I, I've talked to uh, many professionals. I'd be curious to know uh, what my friends and peers on this call think about this. But while we expect some short-term softening, say over the next 24 months, maybe 36 months, uh, we expect commercial real estate uh, to remain strong in our core central areas. Uh, people are going to have to maintain uh, that cohesiveness, the esprit de corps of their organizations, even with their remote employees, they're still going to want their remote employees to be in the office, uh, to build a, a build team, build community. Uh, I think we're all finding now that we're in month seven, in some cases, you know, month eight or nine of this crisis, um, that uh, remote work is sufficient for maintaining existing uh, business relationships. Uh, it is a poor substitute for building new business relationships, either with new clients, new partners, or new team members. Residential downtown core uh, 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 trends uh, may soften, and that's an area that we are not expert in, uh, but it is an area that we are watching as um, uh, as mid midlife professionals may find it less appealing to be in the downtown core if they have the a greater ability to work remotely. Uh, and so this 
trend that we're seeing certainly in North America of a uh, of a kind of move back to the suburbs uh, to some degree um, may be a long term, maybe not strong trend, uh, but but may have a, a material impact on uh, uh, on uh, urban core uh, residential uh, real estate. Next slide. Uh, given that uh, I, I'm speaking to you from uh, the Detroit uh, region, I cannot uh, miss the opportunity to talk about uh, the automotive and mobility landscape, which I will do briefly. Uh, we see um, uh, some trends in the automotive and mobility landscapes uh, unabated uh, through this crisis. Even though we are seeing a global reduction in miles traveled, we're seeing a significant decrease uh, in public transit. Uh, we think those are uh, trends that are only going to last while the pandemic uh, is active uh, in, in our world. Uh, certainly government mandates uh, that exist for the electrification of the vehicle fleet uh, are going to keep the pressure on vehicle manufacturers and technology companies uh, to accelerate the, uh, the development of electronic, uh, electric powered vehicles. We think there's going to be no change there. Public transit, uh, even though those trends are down now, uh, there's really no other option uh, in most urban areas and we're going to see public transit uh, bounce back. Uh, the issue there might be uh, public funding for public transit as our governments, both local and national, uh, are going to see severe uh, budget constraints. Uh, and those budget constraints uh, will also apply uh, to a, perhaps a slowdown in the autonomous vehicle rollout. Uh, that technology we do expect to slow down, uh, primarily because that is, a, that is reliant upon a strong public-private partnership. The corporations uh, and the technology companies uh, that are working on autonomous technology, uh, certainly the, uh, the, uh, the existing automotive manufacturers are going to be more cost constrained. Uh, they are going to be in a very difficult financial position. Their ability to continue to invest in autonomous will certainly um, will level down, if not even uh, slow down uh, over the next several years. And certainly government's ability to uh, do the infrastructure development uh, that is going to be needed for successful autonomous vehicle rollout will also be delayed. Uh, last slide, please. So for those of us who run organizations like uh, those of us who are on this call today, uh, we think that there's a handful of basic rules. Uh, one, uh, we need to be incredibly responsive. We cannot rely on our existing uh, strategies. Uh, you know, when I say it's time for plan B, it might be time for plan, you know, plan D. Uh, you know, pivoting and pivoting quickly, uh, being responsive, uh, you know, is, is going to be the key, and I, I know that sounds like a, a very trite statement, uh, but we need to constantly be analyzing, literally on a week-to-week -week basis, what does our region, what, what do our region, what does our region need, excuse me, uh, and how can we position our organizations to be most useful for what the challenge is right now? Also, uh, how do we use our platforms? Uh, our organizations run at the intersection of the nonprofit, corporate, and public sector communities. And we have relevancy in all three sectors, unlike um, uh, most other organizations uh, and public entities. How do we use this platform, this convening power, this communications power, to really be uh, thought leaders in, uh, in, in our community? How do we use data, either data that we create, that we have through our cluster associations, through our own research? How do we um, uh, combine data that we're seeing uh, internationally and nationally and apply that to our region so we can help public officials and our corporate leaders think through what might be coming next and how to respond uh, right now? And for those organizations that have not focused on business startups and uh, business expansion and business retention, uh, 
now is not the time uh, to continue that, that trend. Uh, the, the importance of supporting our small business community in ways that most organizations, uh, including uh, the one that I represent, had not even thought about in the past is going to be paramount. Uh, in the United States, we are expecting to lose anywhere between 15 and 30 percent of our very small businesses and even more in underserved communities, especially our minority communities. Uh, if we are not aggressive in helping uh, those existing businesses weather this extended storm and helping new businesses start up as we begin to emerge from this, all of our other work will become uh, for naught. So that is uh, kind of my quick overview, uh, hopefully not, <laughs> hopefully quick enough, and I'll turn it back to Patricia, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Sandy. This was really uh, a different way of seeing things. So uh, we were talking yesterday, most from the US perspective, as you were saying, and I have one question for you. Yesterday we were discussing that clusters should take uh, a stronger leadership in their ecosystems, you know, go beyond their traditional role as facilitators of uh, a value chain. Uh, how do you think uh, it's, it's, it is possible to do that? Uh, what are your recommendations for, for a cluster organization that wants to take that leadership? Well, yes, uh, I, I, I would have two responses to that, Patricia. Number one, uh, many of our organizations that are focused on supporting clusters have done uh, very strong, extensive uh, supply chain analysis. Uh, this is now a regional asset, not just an asset for uh, the cluster communities that we, we support. Because uh, understanding how the supply chain can be readapted to other industries, to support other industries, industries in our region uh, to be able to uh, attract uh, that uh, those supply chain uh, companies to our regions to help with uh, our existing needs is, is, is hugely important. And the second point I would make on that, Patricia, is uh, you know, those of us who, uh, our organization is over 120 years old, uh, and, you know, therefore we have a long and strong history and tradition, uh, but we have had to put that tradition on the shelf uh, because uh, this is a uh, unprecedented international health crisis and economic crisis, uh, and given the resources that we have, we're quite large, uh, that we have had to adapt and provide new resources in a new way to a new audience, uh, and that has really become our mantra because it is our public duty uh, as a nonprofit organization uh, to really address the needs of our region, uh, and more so than any other time in our history. There is a question from uh, Kristen Kettles, our uh, chair of the TCI advisory board. How does the racing partisan divide in many places affect the role of an economic development leader, also given higher demands to address uh, policy issues like social justice? Yeah. So the uh, uh, the the uh, thank you, Kristen, for the uh, question, and it's uh, always good to hear from you. The uh, the the pressure, and I, I, I'm hesitant to use the word pressure because uh, this is something we should all be working on, but the pressure for inclusive development uh, and inclusive economic growth uh, has never been stronger across the planet. Uh, for uh, uh, may, perhaps I mean not the first time, but more pronounced uh, at this moment in history, we are seeing corporations take the lead in a very aggressive way to say that, you know, our organizations are going to be inclusive. We are going to make very strong commitments, very public commitments, and a very uh, metric-driven commitments to advance uh, diversity and inclusion in our not only in our organizations but in terms of how our organizations impact uh, are the regions that we operate in uh, and 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 our supply chains so uh, this is going to be a long-lasting trend and if organizations that are involved in economic development that are supporting clusters uh, that are involved in public policy uh, if we are not leading in that space 
uh, and providing the resources, providing the thought leadership, providing the tools that both the public sector and the corporate sector are going to need uh, to be able to actually fulfill that mission, uh, we are not we are not fulfilling the the, the mission that is uh, that is uh, before us as as cluster uh, as the cluster community today, uh, and I cannot stress that uh, more strongly. Thank you so much, Sandy. This was really great. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and see you in the next conversation in our TCI Board of Advisors meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. My pleasure to be involved. I appreciate the time.